Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Ben Kat. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Scorpio Season. I'm here with my guest, Lisa. <laughs> uh, hey, Ben Kat, are you eating a snack today? Uh, it's, it's more a beverage than a snack. So what I have here is uh, an attempt at a cappuccino with uh, hazelnut milk, hazelnut for itch. And it turns out it's not the best milk for coffee, but I'm drinking it anyway. But lesson learned. I'm going <laughs> to switch to soy. Uh, right. uh, that's cool. Um, great. So uh, along those lines, we're talking about H's today. Oh, I actually, I'm actually eating a snack today, and it just so happens to be honey crisp apples, which I thought was kind of funny. Oh, okay. So, perfect. Yeah. yeah, we should both... Um, Compete in our uh, letter team <laughs> snack each week, and uh, we'll see who wins. I think yeah, you win okay. this one. I win this round. Great. <laughs> I, li- I like this game already. This is cool. Um, okay. Uh, great. Okay. So right, so. Today we're talking about H's. Um, so as we usually do, we have a uh, Venkat has made a two by two, um, which is a graph that has two axes. One is what Venkat knows about a topic, and one is what Lisa knows about a topic. Um, so before we start our show, we're going to go through kind of our list of topics and rate ourselves of how much we know about these things. So at the end, we'll get a two by two of what they look like. Um, and if you're watching it on YouTube, you can, you'll follow along. But for those of you that are just listening, we'll try and talk our way through it. Um, great. Okay. So the first topic that we have is Hannah Arendt. Um, I think I know something about Hannah. I haven't read all of her books. So I feel like I'm not a Hannah Arendt expert. Um, so this is a quantitative thing, right? We can each rate how many books of hers we've read. I've read only one. So have you read more than one? Yes, I have read more than one book of hers. Um, yeah. So you get more than me? Great. How many did she write? She wrote like three or four major books, right? The Eichmann one, the Human Condition one, and a couple of others. Yeah, so All the right, three... The, this is good. Yeah, the three I've read, well, we can talk about it later. I think she's written like six or seven would be my guess. But of those, like maybe or four are like big anyways well known um cool okay the next topic on the list is the happening and so this refers to the bitcoin happening which should be happening soon i actually i should go look up what the the new latest um predictions of when it happens is um uh so this is obviously something you know way more about than me i'm actually going to put myself down in the lower quadrant i know basically what it is but in a very for this audience i would count as ignorant okay uh, yeah i probably know more than most people about the happening but i don't know exactly there's 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 a couple details i'm fuzzy on but i could i could go look at those up um all right cool. okay uh the next one we have is hair which i believe you mean like hair follicles so things growing on our heads um yes I would put myself as I'm, I'm I've actually, this is actually a funny topic because I am learning more things about hair right now. Um, so I would put myself on the growth curve for hair. Um, All right. Um, I would say I'm pretty low down on hair, but uh, also on the growth curve out of necessity because <laughs> I have a feeling this will be the longest I end up going without a haircut in a while. So mm. All right. Cool. Okay. So we're, both of us are just a little bit above nose, a little something. So in the first quadrant, I believe. Um, and though I would say you probably, you should know more than me just by virtue of being a girl. You I do. Know? Probably. That's probably true. So I'm going to put myself on the axis of like neither ignorant nor <laughs> not ignorant. I have hair. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Hitchhiker's the guy. Mediocre hair score. Oh, Ben Cat. What? I'm sorry. Oh, HHG stands for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I have read the book, so I would say I am that level of experience. Have you read all of HHG. them, like the seven volumes or whatever in the trilogy? No, I've only read the, the one called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, so I'll give you maybe a little bit, but I'm like a super expert on this. So I'm way up there. Great. Because I've read all of it cool. like at least three or four times, plus everything else he's ever written. So, all right, halfway points. Halfway points. Um, I don't think I'm like a very, I wouldn't, I, I don't 
I think I'm a very big expert on halfway points. I would put myself in the negative column. All right, and uh, we'll explain what halfway points are when we get to it. But mm -hmm. uh, I would say I just learned a little something about it since I went through one major one. Cool, okay. great. Right, so that's our radar for the week. Great. Uh, where should we start then, Kat? Let's start with uh, Hannah Arendt, both of our okay. uh, favorite writers, but I think more so for you since uh, your Twitter handle currently is your favorite Jamesian Arendtian, right? So um, you identify enough with her work that you sort of um, stolen her name for Twitter. All right, so yeah, get us started. Yeah. I think I changed my handle last week, but yes, it was there for a little bit. This is true. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, so, um, I think, so I think Hannah Arendt is legitimately one of the best, I would almost call her like a historical philosopher of the last century. I think she did a great job of putting, um, a lot of the political and like social movements that happened into context, like for kind of what they mean for us as humans. Um, and so the three works of hers that I read that I really liked um, were Eichmann in Jerusalem, which I think is her most approachable work. Um, it's written in like a journalistic style. So it's basically her sending back reports from a courtroom in Israel about a, um, what do you call it? Court case that they had where they tried a, um, bureaucratic flunky from the Nazi party by the name of Eichmann. Um, so that's, that's, I think, so that book is really good because I think it puts the, um, one thing I really liked about it is it really puts the Holocaust into, um, really gives you a good understanding of like the social mindset and like political dynamics that were happening amongst um, both like the party flunkies of the Nazis and like what they were attempting to achieve through the Holocaust and like kind of the development of the um, that like whole process, if that makes sense. Like there were stages to getting rid of the Jews in Germany um, mm -hmm. until they hit upon the final solution. It kind of walks through each of those stages. And um, it's considered as a work quite controversial, which I think is interesting um, because it places some of the blame of the um, ability of the Nazi party to decimate the Jewish population on a particular faction within the Jewish like community, particularly like the Zionists, um, specifically in some of the ways that they worked along with the Nazis to help move Jews out of Germany. Um, um, so this is um, kind of yeah. interesting. So this is the book where she coined the phrase banality of evil, right? Um, yes, okay. that's correct. And, yeah. and if I remember correctly from her biography, uh, in her early career, she was um, the sort of partner of Martin Heidegger, who later turned into a Nazi collaborator, right? So th there's some interesting personal history there. Yeah. So I was reading, and so her and Heidegger actually had a, a romantic, quite a, quite a, romantic relationship um i was actually just reading about this last week um she was 18 he was in their 30s and she was a new student in his like philosophy classes and they um they started basically what i assume is like an affair because heidegger is married um and then it lasted i want to say for a year and then they broke it off um yeah but anyways the thing i was looking at talked about how heidegger originally like at the start aligned himself with the Nazi party and spent about a year within the party and then decided to, that that was not a good idea and left. Yep. So yeah, he was, and then he wasn't. Yeah. I don't know. And Heidegger is, I think, a major enough philosopher that it's uh, not easy putting him in like, um, political simplistic boxes, like same as Nietzsche and others. Like you can't, like it's kind of silly to label somebody like Heidegger uh, a Nazi sympathizer or something because that's like too reductive of that kind of philosopher. And, okay, so what are the uh, other two books and then let's um, hear your ranking of the three books and I'll give you my ranking of my one book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, man, ranking's hard. So I think maybe the easiest way to explain them is to kind of like, so Eichmann and Jerusalem is a journalistic work that um, 
and sort of does a good job of outlining the history and the social kind of things that were happening um, in context of like the Holocaust based around this like court case that she's reporting on. Um, Origins of Child Totalitarianism is I believe her longest work um, and most ambitious. Um, I would put that into like, I almost call it like a historical philosophication um, because it's not like a, she does a really good work in like contextualizing a lot of political movements. And um, I think she does, my understanding of the work is that it's a lot of explaining how and why the conditions became possible for um, totalitarianism. Um, and the three branches that she goes into in the book are anti-Semitism, and she traces the history of anti-Semitism, which I think is really, it's just like really fascinating. Um, she ties it back to like the destruction of the, um, is it the destruction, kind of the, the going away of the aristocracy is kind of like the roots of it, um, which is interesting. And then so there's, there's three pillars that lead to totalitarianism. Um, the first is anti-Semitism. The second is imperialism. And then the third thing that she talks about is totalitarianism. And she explains how, so it's historical, right? But it's like kind of giving you um, this like cultural lens to look at these historical events. So actually when I was reading it, I found it a little challenging sometimes because she sort of assumes an assumption. She sort of has this assumption that you understand the historical events. And so she layers context on top of it. But if you're like me and don't really like know all the historical events, sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what mm -hmm. she's talking about. Um, yeah. but, so that works like really interesting from that perspective. And then she, her, the third work of hers that I've read, I've actually read four, but I don't really remember the fourth. The third one is um, The Human Condition, which I would kind of, The Human Condition is really fun because it's a, um, I would almost call it a critique of Marx's, um, it's a really br brilliant critique of Marx's um, labor theory of value I think yep. um but she does it in like a really interesting huh. way that's incredibly philosophical and in that she goes back to ancient Greece like cultural um archetypes and sort of deconstructs work using the Greek um social construction and how things were set up um which I say is like very philosophical because a lot of philosophy seems to use like ancient Greek um, yeah. So this is the one I have read. So I, I think we can compare and contrast our takeaways from that. So interestingly, even I thought that the uh, sort of critique of Marxism was almost like um, a peripheral subplot in the book. Like it, it was almost a side effect of a larger project she was going after, which I thought was very interesting because uh, the way I read it, it was a historical construction of the evolution of uh, human archetypes in relation to, I think, two things, uh, how you work and how you sort of relate to others politically, right? So uh, you've got the laboring human and the making human and then the full human who is capable of action by appearing in public, right? So I really liked that um, typology. And the other thing um, I, I really appreciated about that is you're right that a lot of Western philosophy sort of draws from Greek tradition, but a lot of it also sort of falls into the trap of thinking of that as some sort of ideal. Whereas in her mm -hmm. case, the Greek condition is simply an origin condition. And then uh, she talks about how like Christianity added like an um, advanced layer on top of that through forgiveness. And then finally you get to like um, I guess socialism as a sort of deviancy, but then she died just before I think socialism got taken down by neoliberalism, right? So 1960s, 70s. So I think she would have really had a lot to say about what happened after 1980 with Reagan and stuff. She would, I think she would have liked it. But uh, yeah, so that's the one book uh, I've read. And uh, the origins of um, totalitarianism, around the time Trump got elected, I saw a lot of people sharing excerpts of it. So I've read those excerpts. <laughs> and the Eichmann one, apart from the banality of evil, uh, I, I just remembered that the other thing I know about that is when I was a kid, I used to read Reader's Digest uh, condensed book editions. And there was a condensed book on I captured Adolf Eichmann. So this was written by the Israeli spy team leader who went into Argentina and captured uh, uh, Adolf Eichmann. And, and one thing really stuck in my head, like apparently in the last minute when they actually went down the street and arrested him, what mm. actually gave him away is they were still kind of doubtful. Is this old man really the Nazi guy or whatever? What gave him away was his uh, way of walking. 
So we, uh, apparently Europeans saunter sort of casually, whereas Americans walk briskly. And I think he was pretending to be an American or something. But that was sort of the litmus test of, oh, this guy is from Europe and he's European, therefore he must be Eichmann. And then they arrested him. Anyway, little anecdote. Yeah. No, so actually, like, I think I'm really glad you brought that up because that was kind of one of the, like, crazy things about Eichmann in Jerusalem. Like, this is sort of, like, secondary to Hannah Arendt, but the whole story of Eichmann is, like, the Israeli... And, like, Hannah brings it up because she's, like, it kind of underlines the legitimacy of the trial because the Israelis went to Argentina and kidnapped this guy to bring him back to Israel to stand him on trial as like the person that they were persecuting for. Mm -hmm. And so like his trial was like a standard, um, was trying to like be a standard like way for the community to kind of come out and like get out I think some of the blame that they had for what had happened for the Holocaust it was almost like this national so the, the sh- it, I, it was a little bit of a show trial um and it who yeah. they got to come and testify and it was like a very it was very politicized it wasn't like just like here are the facts and she does a really good job of kind of showing the whole process that it was as the interesting kind of like all the different sort of weird things that were going on with that so as yeah like as a book i thought it like she does a great job uh, writing it out speaking of show trials it also reminds me of um uh, are you familiar with the dreyfus affair so Mm. d-r-e-y-f-u-s-s so this was a famous she talks about that in um origins of totalitarianism oh she does okay because i've read about the dreyfus affair and i think that became a novel mayor of casterbridge i don't know but yeah that was a famous anti-semitic case in 19th century France, I want to say. And yes. uh, yeah, so it just struck me that there's all, like, even though it might seem oddly specific to label anti-Semitism as one of the pillars of totalitarianism, I think at least mm. in Western history, it's actually not a specific thing. It's kind of a general streak running through all of Western history, starting with sort of uh, the origins of Christianity. So it's like the original uh, narcissistic wound of uh, Christianity or something like that. And when you look around, say, so this is something that I find very interesting because coming from Asia, um, the Jewish community and its role in history simply do not loom that large on the historical canvas. There are other communities that sometimes play the roles of localized scapegoats, but no community that plays this sort of standard history role of like, it's actually a thread in history that oppressing Jews is how history moves forward. So that's missing in Asian history, which I kind of find interesting. So Asian totalitarianism has its sort of equivalent things to anti-Semitism, but they're kind of like localized and don't acquire all this historical weight to it, at least I think. Yeah. That's cool. Right. So uh, what else uh, should we sort of know about Hannah Arendt and her thinking? Oh, so you wanted to say how you would rate. Well, I think the way you initially okay, yeah. the thing is how you would rate. So how would you rate your one book? Or um... <laughs> the one book is the best book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your three books, what are the ranking? Oh, man. So I think in a Mm, if I'm gonna, ra- I'm gonna rank them in terms of approachability. Okay. Um, I would put Eggman and Jerusalem as the most approachable. Um, I would put Origins of Totalitarianism actually as the second most approachable. I think the Human Condition was probably that book took me the longest. I just found it incredibly dense. Um, that that makes sense because it's the most sort of theoretically and conceptually philosophical. And I think that's why I ended up picking up that book as the first thing to read. Like uh, I read it in 2016, December, uh, again, around the Trump election, because she was getting talked about so much. And even though everybody was quoting the Eichmann book and the totalitarianism book, uh, in, a, in a way, I wanted to go straight for the dense philosophy because I already kind of had read enough about the history that I wasn't interested in reading more sort of, you know, dragging history through, but I really enjoyed the human condition. It was, like you said, a very dense read, but yeah, I ended up liking it so much. I did a whole uh, slide deck on it. It's on Ribbon Farm somewhere. And what I did with it was uh, I sort of transposed the basic arguments to Silicon Valley maker culture, like how Silicon Valley has this sort of doer culture. And I wanted to sort of map that to her uh, 
Homo Faber uh, archetype of uh, making and how that's not fully human. So uh, we should link to that um, later. But yeah, so I, that slide deck, I called it the computational condition instead of the human condition. So Hannah Arendt for Aspies. Oh, that sounds good. Thank you. That's really cool. Um, yeah. She has, there's two other books of hers that are currently on my reading list. Um, I guess there's, there's two other things I want to say. There's, so there's two books of hers that I'm really interested in. One is called On Revolution and the other is On Violence, um, which I think are more, I think they're going to be interesting because they do a good job of kind of pointing out like governance and um, protest, which like how, how does like, so I think on violence is like the role of violence in the political spectrum, um, which I don't think we really talk about all that much. Um, except who was it like, I want to say like Stalin or Lenin who had something about like, there was like a famous gun quote, uh, something about staring at a gun or like, anyways. Okay. We'll um, dig that up. Okay. And that's like, yeah, I'll have to look it up. Um, so that's like on violence. And then on revolution is about how does like change happen in governments is my guess. Again, I haven't read it. Um, but um, the other thing that from her, so it's like one thing. And then the second thing is that I got a book recommendation from um, her, her on totalitarian, origins of totalitarianism that I'm really excited about, which is Dick Tocqueville's um, Democracy in America. That sounds weird to be like, I have this one book recommendation from Hannah that I'm really excited about reading, but that's the one. Um, huh. And I feel like. I feel like her on revolution is like a good, is going to be a good companion work to Tocqueville's democracy in America, but I haven't read either yet. I'm just excited about them. So I've read bits and pieces of Tocqueville and it's, it's one of those things that's by now so famous and installed into sort of the psyche of all historical analysis that it, it feels mm -hmm. like almost not worth the trouble because anybody who writes anything about the history of America kind of like gestures at Tocqueville's uh, sort of, observations in passing but on Arendt uh, uh, are you going to be an Arendt completist are you going to read everything she's ever written I'm I would like to be there eventually yeah okay though recently I was at a bookstore and they had like a compendium of like it's like she they, someone went through and took like all her works that didn't fit in a book or unfinished stuff or whatever and like made a book out of it um and Having gone through a bunch of Jane Jacobs papers, um, I don't know how excited I am about reading all because there's something. So it's like this weird thing about like, like finished works are like really valuable. Unfinished works are like not as good as finished works. Like this is also true in like paintings. I've decided like as someone who's a new painter, I hate things until I finish them. Like stuff just isn't good until it's done. So like I'm not. Yeah, that's actually such an excellent segue point into Douglas Adams that I think we should jump into Hitchhiker's Guide. Let's do it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the reason I asked the completest question is, as you were saying that you want to read the rest of Hannah Arendt's works, I was thinking about, it. are there any authors about whom I feel the same way? And honestly, uh, that's one reason Douglas Adams makes it so high on my radar, because um, he's one of the few writers who makes me want to read everything he's ever written. And I'm that way right now about Terry Pratchett and to a certain extent, Agatha Christie. So those would be my three that I've made an effort to read basically everything they've written. Um, but uh, with Douglas Adams, I think I've actually done it. As far as I know, there's nothing he's written that I haven't read at least twice. Uh, but uh, yeah, speaking of incompletions, uh, Douglas Adams also left an incomplete um, novel. So this was the Salmon of Doubt which was going to be the third Dirk Gently novel. So even though we put Hitchhiker's Guide on the list, um, Douglas Adams is known for the Hitchhiker's Guide, which is uh, seven volumes. Then he's got the Dirk Gently detective series. That's uh, two completed novels and this incomplete novel called The Salmon of Doubt. And he's got it like a bunch of like nonfiction. There's a book on evolution that's really fun. Um, uh, okay, so that's... Um, Douglas Adams. So you've read uh, the first one, right? Hitchhiker's Guide. All right. What did you think of it? I thought it was brilliant. I loved it. Um, I think if I was going to write a novel, I would want it to be in the same style, just kind of this, <laughs> I would almost call it like pseudo absurdist practicalism as a tone. That's just because of, uh, why did you read the rest if you like that one so much. 
I don't know. <laughs> Do it. Uh, but, but the reason I ask is uh, Hitchhiker's Guide and Douglas Adams in general is one of the very reliable men versus women litmus test reads I've ever seen. Like universally, if I talk to like, you know, general like geeks and like STEM engineering math or whatever, uh, most guys love it and most women who try it are kind of like man it's okay it's kind of like got some good jokes but i didn't really get into it so i've actually i actually ran a poll on this in twitter and it's literally turned out this way so i'm not quite sure what it is about uh, his style but apparently that uh, you described it well pseudo absurdist uh, uh, what did you call it pseudo absurdist uh, realist mm-hmm. realism Practical or pragmatic? Practicalism, yeah. Practicalism. That's exactly it. I think pseudo absurdist uh, practicalism, but there's also sort of a deep vein of um, nihilism in it. And the nihilism comes through more and more in the later novels in the series. And it ends on a like, uh, truly nihilistic note, which I won't spoil for you. But uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> and I'm honestly glad to hear you say that you really liked the book. And also that you're trying to, if you wanted to write a novel, that's the kind you would write because... Uh, a same here I'm actually I've got like several drafted novels vaguely <laughs> going off on like the Douglas Adams style and I've written a couple of uh, short things already more non-fiction that are like basically attempts to learn his style of writing so yeah I think we shared that it's like um, it's a style that calls for imitation but interestingly it's it's very 80s this is something that uh, I think um, uh, more than one millennial um, reader has told me like it, it has a very 80s vibe to it, kind of like, you know, Terminator movies or um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's, it's got that something about it is very 80s in its sensibility. And I think that's probably true. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Hitchhiker's Guide is honestly the closest thing I have to a Bible, as in I, if I if I need an answer to any conundrum, my general question is, what would the Hitchhiker's Guide say? It's, it's sort of my um, reference point, or what do you call it, touchstone thing. Uh, I read it first as a teenager, and then I've basically been rereading it every few years ever since. So I'm now 46, and, or I'm going to be 46. So I think I must have read it between the age of, say, 13 or 14, and now at least six or seven times, read through complete. So that's, so I'm not only a completist, I'm a multiple time over com- completist with Hitchhiker's Guide. That's cool, then, Kat. I don't think I have anything I've read that many times. Do you reread a lot? Do you read anything a lot or reread anything a lot? I don't think I do. There's a few things, recently there have been things that I want to go back and reread. Um, but not anything quite that way. Um, hmm. That's interesting. I think I'm a, I used to be an obsessive rereader of a lot of things, usually pulp fiction, the comfort read kind, and, and that's kind of like the obvious kind of thing. Um, but Hitchhiker's Guide is not a comfort reread for me. So like Agatha Christie novels are basically comfort rereads. Like if I set it aside for six years and go back, I'll have kind of forgotten the plot and sometimes even who did it. So mm-hmm. it'll actually be a new murder mystery for me. But with Hitchhiker's Guide, the rereading I think is actually um, uncovering new layers or something. Like each time I reread it, I find like a new layer of jokes and philosophical co- commentary and so forth. So it, it really repays rereading. I think finally I might be getting too old for it. I think I'm like um, strip minded dry of all insight it has to offer, but it's still really funny to read. Anyway. I have to say that your, these books, like, so you mentioned Terry Pratchett, um, Douglas Adams and Agatha Christie as your like three things that you've read the most. Um, Some part of me wants to be like, yeah, those are kind of like the cartoons of literature, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Does that yeah. seem accurate to you? Um, I think that's totally accurate. It's uh, in the sense that they form closed worlds with very clear archetypal characters. And that's actually 
connecting back to Hannah Arendt, that's why I resonate with her philosophy so much. It's cartoon philosophy in the sense that it's constructed around several archetypal human types mm -hmm. as sort of the engine of history, right? It's very serious philosophy work, but it's built in sort of um, cartoonist, cartoon aesthetic, which to me is high praise, by the way, not uh, sort of a denigration. But uh, yeah, so Agatha Christie pioneered the detective, uh, detective genre. Like she came right after... Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, who had Sherlock Holmes and Watson, but the Sherlock Holmes stories are kind of like, like impressionistic slices of life kind of thing. So Holmes mm -hmm. is well characterized and some of the painting of Victorian color is really nice, but the stories are kind of like ridiculous. They're not very good, but- uh, No, Agatha, but they're so much fun. Oh, totally. I, I used to reread um, Holmes novels as well, uh, short stories as well, quite a few times, but it didn't stick with me in adulthood. I don't think I've reread them in a couple of decades now. But Christie, I think the reason it works is she has very, like you can predictably, not just Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple, the core detectives are of course like archetype uh, detective types, but even all the characters, there's uh, uh, the predictable types and predictable reasons murders, murderers do what they do. So there's like, almost you can learn the calculus of how she sets plots in motion and what the resolution will be. Like you can guess at the psychology of the solution, even if you can't guess at the actual murderer, right? So that's cartoonish in that way. It's like log library mysteries, literally, right? And uh, uh, Douglas Adams is also very cartoonish because his characters, Arthur Dent, uh, Ford Prefect, uh, Zafford, they're all like very elemental types. And they're not just elemental, they're elemental on like a cosmic scale. So they're archetypes for the universe, not just planet Earth. Uh, even his detective novels, uh, so Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. So mm -hmm. <laughs> he solves kind of vaguely philosophical, supernatural mysteries that involve like ghosts from other worlds and stuff. So mm -hmm. again, cartoonish, exactly right. And Terry Pratchett is like, the most cartoonish of all. It's like literally take everything about, you know, uh, I would say Terry Pratchett is a neoliberal shill. So basically all of this world is political commentary about what he thinks is the right way to, you know, run a society um, using a lot of mm -hmm. satire and parody of um, earth mythology. So it's a literal flat disc world that's on the back of an elephant. So uh, or, or back of elephants. Uh, so it's like, making fun of that mythology, but all the characters there are like uh, cartoon archetypes of uh, actual human civilization with like very thinly disguised uh, translations to the fantasy world. Like there's equivalents of Europe, and Morpork, which is the main city is basically London. So it's like very one-to-one. -one. So really good satire, but in a very caricatured way. So yeah, it totally works. So I think you... <laughs> You spotted something that I don't think I'd realized. Yes, my novel choices are novel versions of cartoon universes, just like Futurama or Simpsons. So, <laughs> thank you. I learned something about myself. <laughs> Quite nice. um, let's see. All right. So I think that's all I have to say about Hitchhiker's Guide, unless you want some Hitchhiker's Guide Q and A. Um. No, my my takeaway from Hitchhiker's Guide, we can get to in another episode. I have it under a different thing. I don't want to give it away, though. Um, oh, okay. So you're going to spring that surprise. on me as a surprise. Yeah. Right. I'm so surprised. Nice? I also need to go back and reread it. But, um, All of them. Uh, so we have haircuts next. Or hair. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a quick and short topic. My hair is... Uh, I think I last got a haircut about five weeks ago and I think it's entering the danger stage where for the next couple of weeks it's going to look worse and worse and uh, until it looks totally terrible <laughs> then we will be in regimes of hair growth that I've never been in. So. so do you have a mitigation plan for escaping this like impending situation or are you just gonna like roll into it? I think um at some point, my wife will get sick of looking at me and uh, give me a haircut whether I like it or not. So um, one of her uh, stepsisters is actually a hairstylist and she's offered to like coach us through the haircut. So we might actually do that. So maybe we'll do some quarantine era haircutting. What about you? Home style haircutting. My hair is growing out. I actually, it's funny that you put hair on the list. I wouldn't have put it on the list, but... Um, I, for, 
for reasons. Um, for a long time, I've kind of like had just given up on attempting to do things with my hair um, as a human, just decided that it was impossible. And like, there were like three basic things that I knew how to do, most of which was like wear it down and let it dry. Like just the most basic mm -hmm. thing you can do with hair. Um, but for some reason, a few weeks ago, I don't know, I decided that I was going to figure out how to do hair, <laughs> specifically my hair. Um, so I, I don't know if you know, I have, I have like hair clips now. This is new. Hair clips oh, are new. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not even sure people who know me would notice, but I've started doing my hair now. I don't know if you count this like messy style is done, but this is like, this is new. Um, it's growing okay. out, but it's, it's, we're, we're managing it. We're learning how to manage it. I watched some YouTube videos. I found a Cosmo post and bought all the things it said to buy to make your hair look and feel good. I don't know. I own a silk pillow now. <laughs> pillow wow. <laughs> Because it's supposed to, um, so I have, my hair is like this. So part of the reason that I never thought I could, if this has to do, so this is history, um, personal history. Part of the reason that I never understood how hair works, particularly my hair, had a lot to do with growing up in a very humid place, which is Houston. Okay. And um, having a different hair type than my mom, um, who has, so like her advice that she would give on how to do your hair and the things that made sense to her for her hairstyle did not work on my hairstyle. But none of us understood this because it was the 90s. And why? So is this just your hair is curly like mine, right? So is it to do with managing curls? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whereas my mom had finer. My mom is blonde and has fine blonde hair. My hair is... And my sister... I have an older sister. I think this also adds to it. I have an older sister whose hair is brunette but is very closer in type hair type to my mom's hair um whereas I was the second daughter and had hair that was not at all like either of their hair um so but as a mom you know you've got two kids and then you know eventually we had she had a third younger my brother is younger than me and his hair is a lot like both of their hairs um so I was like the odd one out economies but of scale she did the same thing with all three of you <laughs> Why would you not? I mean, it makes sense. But, you know, so growing up, like my understanding of how to do hair and Houston is humid and that plays a role because if you do things, certain things that you do to to curly hair in humid weather, particularly um, give adverse results almost yeah. generally, like every single time. Like it's just, um, so I had a lot of struggle. That's one of the few things about hair, even I'm familiar with, though my history of hair is like, I've had the same haircut for the last 30 years, which is, you know, just do whatever, like not even think about it. But yeah, I do notice that uh, in humid climates, it behaves uh, differently and curls up differently and so forth. So um, my solution to that has always been just get haircuts frequently enough that you cut below the curl line. So it's not a problem at all. So you don't, it, you, the problem goes away, but it tends not to be an acceptable solution for women. Right. It's not a practical solution for women. Um, yeah. Anyways, I'm back in Houston now. So I'm finally, as an adult, figuring out how to like manage the hair humidity problem. Um, it's been fun. I'm having a great time. It's really, yeah, it's been really fun. And it's actually, it's like winnable. It's like a winnable problem. Um, straight so, uh, what's your normal schedule for getting um, Haircut? haircuts or hair stylings? Or, yeah. So for a long time, I was a once a year when I was on vacation hair cutter. Um, wow, okay. <laughs> since then, it's like whenever I feel like it's getting too long. So maybe every six months. Um, I had a haircut okay. stylist I really liked in San Francisco before I moved to Texas. Um, and I actually had a trip planned to SF for, I want to say March. That was a month ago now. So I was going to try and get my hair cut in SF in March, but that didn't happen. So um, this is interesting. I think it's one of the most dramatic differences between men and women, because the first time I realized that women actually do that, that they like style, particular stylists so much that they'll even travel to a different city to get a haircut. I was like, what the hell? 
<laughs> this is like so expensive buying an air ticket or like extending a trip or something. So my wife has done that a few times over the years. And the first time she did it, I think we even had a little argument or fight about it or something. But now I've kind of like made my peace with the fact that that's one of the big gender differences that for women, it actually seems to matter. But if you're on a six months to year long schedule, then you're not actually pr probably not going to be affected by the uh, pandemic uh, hair emergency effects mm -hmm. at all, right? Like when was mm -hmm. your last haircut? About six months ago. Okay, so you're almost coming. I'm due, due for a haircut. It's getting too long. I'm about to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have long hair again, is basically what's going to happen. I haven't had long hair in years. Okay. I usually keep it like between my shoulders and my ears kind of, or chin. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going back to long hair territory, I think is what's happening. Um, well, so am I. So that's new territory for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So for some of us, it's a return to old stomping grounds. For some of us, it adventures to new places. Um, I feel like you're going to yeah. be in good company, though. I was talking to a friend recently. Uh, so... They were talking about buying a hat. Um. And because they needed it to put on their hair when they went places. And I was like, but it's quarantine. Where would you wear the hat? Um, and they're like, oh, when I like go out on the street to go on walks and stuff, I need to like put the hat on, which I thought was cute. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm, I don't know what I'll do because I, it's, since it'll probably get to longer than it's ever been before. And I might like uh, allow my wife to do a little trimming, but not too much because it could like, have unpredictable effects. So one of the things is I, I do know that my hair is curly and stiff, so it poofs out a little bit, but it's not mm -hmm. tight enough or stiff enough that it'll become a fro. So it'll probably like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, at some point gravity will take over and it'll collapse in some weird way. So I'm kind of like I'm curious to see where it goes. <laughs> so, but I, I don't think I'll like it because <laughs> beyond the point, I don't like my hair long, but we'll see, we'll track progress on hair in the future weeks until we both get haircuts. So speaking of tracking progress, um, you recently hit a personal milestone and a halfway point in your life. Do you want to talk a little bit about what a halfway point is? And Oh yeah. So uh, I was uh, tracking the number of days since I moved to the U S so that was on August 4th, uh, 1997. So I moved here for grad school. And as of uh, last Friday, I spent, I spent exactly as much time based in the U.S. as in India, so half my life in each place. So now I'm a few days over, so I'm three days more American than um, Indian at this point. So that kind of like, uh, it seemed like an interesting uh, milestone to mark, and um, I called it a life equinox, which seems like a good thing to call it, because if there's something that's probably lifespan scale, it's probably something like immigrating to a new country. Um, there's not that many things that could count as um, halfway points. I guess you could also talk about like if you're migrating geographically. So, uh, I used or to if you switch those. careers, you know. So if you go from being like a strategy consultant to a programmer, um, you could mark your time since you know, mm -hmm. in like life cycle. Um, it's funny that now that's that I'm an unlikely transition, but the other way is likely <laughs> programmer to strategy consultant. Yeah. But, uh, hmm. yeah. yeah. So do you have anything in your life that you would consider like a halfway point that you've been through? Well, so now that you're mentioning it, I do remember I, re I studied abroad. I went to Brazil a couple of times in college, three times. And each was like, I went for three months, seven months and four months, which isn't like, anywhere close to the years that you clearly have like halfway points. But um, I do remember when I would come back to the States having a clock in my head that knew how much time it had been until I had spent as much time in the U.S. since I had been back in Brazil, yeah. if that makes sense. Like, so I, yeah. I knew when I had been back for seven months after having been abroad and like that, there is something kind of, it's kind of a weird period to have this like sort of like cultural, I don't know, almost cultural consciousness or like 
weird background clock ticking that's like yeah like, there's definitely a time consciousness so this is um, of course one of my pet topics since i'm writing a book about time right now but the idea of a temporality as in sort of a time environment that's strongly anchored to like um, uh, cultural rhythms and so forth and it takes time to get um, attuned to them and it takes time to snap out of them so part of things like culture shock come from that right so when i moved I mean, to the, the us from india i think culture shock took me about six months to get over, like properly mm-hmm. get over. Like it's different actually moving to a new country as opposed to visiting as, it as a tourist, because as a tourist, you're always kind of like running yourself in, I, I want to say a tourist virtual machine or something. You're never actually breaking out of it and planting your feet locally. But once you realize you have to sign a lease, you have to like go to school, uh, get a bank account, all that stuff, you're embedded into the operating system of the local environment. And that creates sort of a true shift of um, where your mind has been installed. Uh, But I think uh, the moving countries is uh, also a good example. And this one of like having spent equal amounts of time in the US and India, it it didn't feel like anything. It's just one of those things you mark on a calendar and you you have to actually literally count to even know that it has happened. But uh, the reason Mm -hmm. it struck me as interesting is if you ignore early childhood when your brain is a lot more programmable and therefore you're learning a lot, in some sense, equal periods of time represent equal amounts of like conditioning or learning in some sense. So that's why I was kind of like thinking, all right, if I've spent 22.7 years in each of these two very different countries, my brain is now half programmed to be Indian and half programmed to be uh, American. Of course, that's not a good comparison because I was a child in India and that's like you're conditioned a lot more. So if you wait according to like mm-hmm. learning intensity or conditioning intensity, then I would say I'm still like probably more uh, Indian than American. But in other ways, like take language. We've talked about language um, a couple of episodes ago, right? But uh, language, um, I, I can think in three languages, but my fluency in thinking in the other two is now like the pits. Like I have to force myself. Like right now, uh, I can really fluently only think in English as an inside my own head. Like if I'm thinking about a subject or something, my default language of choice to think in would be English. Whereas when I was a kid growing up in India, I could actually like, um, this is like code switching, but inside your own head. Like I could literally think in Hindi, I could think in English and I could think in Kannada. Now, Hindi and Kannada are like, uh, I actually have to run an emulation mode. I have to like consciously say, all right, I have to turn on Hindi brain or Kannada brain and run it. Mm-hmm. My vocabulary is rusting and it's like fallen away, especially. Uh, there's also this conditioning mm-hmm. and reinforcement thing of what you talk about. Like the only person mm-hmm. I speak Kannada to anymore is my mom when I call her like mm-hmm. every couple of weeks. So it's like five to six minutes of talking in Kannada and thinking in Kannada for every two weeks and using a very narrow restricted set of vocabulary, namely the words I would use in talking to my mom. Right. So that uh, the conditioning involved in that side is eroding. So maybe this is something also like, even though being a kid in India meant I got more conditioned in India, the flip side of that is America is the more recent chapter in my life. So the conditioning is still both strong and being reinforced constantly, whereas Mm -hmm. the Indian parts of my conditioning, are fading radically. Like, I don't think I can drive easily on the left side of the road anymore. I can, I find it hard to navigate parts of India. So there's all that. I'm sure you experienced some of that in Brazil. Uh, Somewhat. I mean, I haven't been back to Brazil in over a decade now, which is incredible because I feel like, so to a certain extent, I feel like my understanding of Brazilian culture is this interesting snapshot of what Brazilian teenagers were like a decade ago, or like college kids were like a decade Uh ago. So um it's fun like some of the friends I made there still like I know how to find them on Twitter um I think at one point I did a a sort of like very cautious tweet thread about comparing certain things in politics to America to Brazil and it was very gratifying for one of my Brazilian friends who I trust to like know what I'm talking about to be like yeah this is still accurate and I was like oh okay cool so like (laughs) some durable some durable impressions but um I think I would like to go back. I don't know. Yeah, that's an important point you bring up, by the way. The idea that when you make such a halfway kind of phase transition, your conditioning in the 
place you're leaving behind kind of freezes at the point you left it. So in your case, 10 years ago and the milieu that you inhabited, namely college kids in Brazil, for me, the same thing. My sort of understanding of India is to a large extent frozen in 1997 and India today is like way, way different. And my, I don't know, younger relatives um, sometimes kind of like call me out on like weird things I have, like I'm frozen in a time machine or something or time warp. Uh, but yeah, so that's my halfway point uh, story. Sounds good. Um, so we have one more topic to talk about, speaking of half, halving things. Um, uh, so we, we have the halvening, um, which yes. maybe it would be fun to start with what your understanding of the halvening is, as a jumping off point. Okay, so I would rate myself as sort of an informed layperson uh, participant in the crypto economy. I do hold some Bitcoin and Ether and stuff. So just from by virtue of having to like uh, play with wallets and things, I know a little bit. So my mm-hmm. understanding it is, of it is uh, the block reward has every so many transactions, I guess. So it went from whatever, 25 per block to 12 and a half and so forth, right? So I'm not quite sure I understand the process by which the block reward gets halved, but when it does, if I understand correctly, the incentives for miners change and uh, there's a question on whether it's already been priced into Bitcoin or not and how people are anticipating. And the last halvening did see price appreciation in Bitcoin, if I remember correctly, right? Was that 20, when was it? I do remember seeing the bump. I believe it happens about every four years. Um, okay, yeah, so I remember seeing the bump in the so last It happened year. in 2016, which is kind of interesting that it just so happens to fall in election years, just because um, oh, that's how it worked yeah. out. Um, there's a certain number of, so what triggers it is a certain number of blocks. And I don't, this is where I'm like, I know what it is, but I don't know the specifics. This is one of the specifics I'm not sure about is how many blocks it is between happenings. Um, but basically what, how you described it is correct. After, let's say, 150,000 blocks, every block, a block happens every 10 minutes. So you could probably back out what four years, every 10 minutes of mm-hmm. four years is. Um, but uh, yeah, the amount, so every time, a, so every cryptocurrency has a different way of new value, new coins getting created and added to the system. Um, trying to think of what another one is. So like some coins, they like create all the coins at the start and then they just kind of hand them out to different people. And so they like have airdrops or where they hand out, that's like distributing coins to people and then hope that people use them. So an economy system grows up around people using them. Um, the way that Bitcoin hands out new coins is to whoever finds the next block gets a reward for finding that block. And that's how new Bitcoin enter the system. So the f- when the first block was mined um, by Satoshi, Satoshi created 50 Bitcoin. And then every block that got created after that put 50 more Bitcoin into the total available supply. Um, So new Bitcoin gets created every time a block happens, new Bitcoin is birthed. Um, And then it, how do you, how do you like give that Bitcoin out? Well, in in Bitcoin, you give it to whoever mined the block. Um, Mm -hmm. So the value of a new block creation gets halved, which is why it's called the halvening. Um, Currently, I believe we're at 12.5 Bitcoin per block. Started at 50, then it was at 25, now it's at 12.5, and then it'll be at 6.25, I believe. So the even the very basic unit economics of electricity prices are, are going to shift radically, right? Yeah, so this is the question, right? Is how, so miners, the amount of money that miners can make off of every, so usually it's like over time, right? Like you can kind of run a calculation, mm-hmm. like I'm going to run the miner 24 hours a day. It costs me, let's say 10 cents an hour to run it. And then there's a return kind of calculation that you can do. that's based on a couple of different factors. Most people, when they mine bitcoins, don't mine. You could mine by yourself, but your chances of ever making any money are very low. Um, mm-hmm. If you end up finding the block, you get to keep all 12 and a half Bitcoins, which is quite a bit these days. Yep. Whatever, it's over 70. It's about 8,000 now. So it'll be, oh yeah, it'll be about a, almost 100,000, I think, at this point. Yeah. 
Yeah. So finding a single block by yourself would be 100K, but your chances of doing that are very, very low because of the number of people that are playing. Um, however, so most people join. You're so doing it, right? You mentioned that you are uh, running miners in your garage right now. Right? I run miners. My Bitcoin miner is not online for reasons, but yeah, I have, I have Bitcoin. Yes, I do Bitcoin mining um, or my coin mining. Um, basically, what most people do, self-included, is you join something called the pool, and then the pool pays out. There's a way of allocating payouts for every block the pool earns, but that's the way that you get more consistent payouts. Anyways. Mm -hmm. Ideas that you can kind of see. And your stake is determined by the hash rate you contribute to the pool or something, right? So if you're like 1% of the hash rate of the pool, you get 1% of any reward anybody finds. You get 1% of the reward for however much. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Um, okay. Yeah. And then anyway, so the, um, anyways, so like the, where was I going with this? Oh, so when you're deciding to mine, you kind of make some decisions about how much Bitcoin you're making back and how much you're spending on electricity. And if it's profitable, you keep doing it. Um, in theory, this is going to cut the amount of Bitcoin that every single miner is getting in half, right? Um, so the question is, will it remain profitable for miners to keep their machines online? Um, the answer depends a lot on what their unit economics look like right now? Are they making more than twice what they spend in electricity? Um, other thing that, there's also a lot of inertia in the mining community in terms of once you've made the capital outlays to acquire the machine, um, if you're losing money, you'll probably turn them off. So maybe there will be a bunch of stuff that turns off. I don't know, it's or, or weird. Or more likely to there's be diverted weird... to uh, other blockchains, right? Because a lot of this, uh... Uh, equipment is kind of generic and it could be repurposed to other blockchains to some extent that are more rewarding. So they're like mercenaries. So, so. It depends. Uh, I think Bitcoin particularly, Bitcoin uses a hash, uses a SHA-256. So if there's another blockchain that uses the same SHA, yeah, you could switch it over. Um, I think that there are other machines that are more flexible in terms of being able to hop between different chains because different chains have different mining algorithms for reasons. Anyways. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. No one really knows what's going to happen. The, um, the general way that everything stays equilibrated, so to speak, is if the Bitcoin price doubles, then you're making the same amount of money and but the amount of bitcoin you've gotten is lower so if the bitcoin price doubles everyone who owns bitcoin make has owns twice as much in terms of assets as they did before um so in the so the, when people ask the question oh do you think the halvening is priced in is like oh do you think the bitcoin price of seven eight thousand dollars as it is today do you think that that encapsulates this coming supply shock, right? So if it's a perfect market with supply and demand, Bitcoin has been producing 12.5 Bitcoin every two, every 10 minutes, there's 12.5 Bitcoin that need to get absorbed into the market at the price of $8,000, right? In theory. Um, so in theory, if the market has been able to consume Bitcoin at that rate, um, what will happen when the supply is cut in half? If I remember correctly, it did the price did go up sort of, as you would expect. So I think, uh, well, a lot of us are hoping it does this time as well. <laughs> nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, when is this due? Like June sometime? No, it's supposed to happen in the next two weeks, I would guess. Oh, wow. It's, it's that close. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Which, All right. So that'll which be is why I put it on today's list. Because so, um, uh, I think I like you... people, people said, end of April, early May is, or it might be June, but someone else, I, at some point, I think I heard someone say they expected it in May. I could go look it up. Okay. So we, we should be able to like, um, find some way to talk about it in the letter I or K. At yeah. I, J, K, L. We'll find some way. L for lightning. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I have no idea. I keep telling people no. to try. I keep telling people they should probably buy Bitcoin now. Like now is probably a good time to buy Bitcoin because on the off chance that it does go up, like I feel like there's a decent amount of upside with like not as much downside, but I could be wrong about that. Maybe there's a huge amount of downside so coming. So normally I would probably disagree with 
um, you, but given what the regular stock market is doing now, it's acting like the crypto market. It's like, if the regular stock market is that terrible, you might as well speculate on the crypto market. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying put all your money in it, but yeah. maybe own a little bit. Like, oh yeah, totally. There, I think you and I are on the same page, but then again, there's also moral hazard of recommending expensive things that you manage to buy cheaply, right? So I got in, like, I think um, the Bitcoins I bought were between six to $800. So I got in fairly oh, wow. cheap. So uh, yeah, it feels disingenuous to tell friends to buy in at 7,000 when I bought in at like 800 most. I think my, I think the first Bitcoin I bought was at like 15 K, which is to give a little bit of a, and I had just started work at like square and it was like right after anyways. Yeah. So I bought Wow. Yeah. That's near the last week. Yeah. It, it went up above, above 20 K a couple yeah. of times. But okay. like 2018. Right. So buying it at 15 after the peak didn't feel terrible. I mean, I clearly have lost money on that Bitcoin. I didn't buy a lot. I think I bought like $200 worth. So it wasn't like, I was losing out on thousands of dollars or whatever, but um, yeah, I don't know. Will it ever go back to that? I don't know. I kind of don't care. I think it, I think it will. Yeah. It, it seems like if you look at the graph, it's like so predictable. There's like five cycles of like periodically spiking above the last all time high. So to a certain extent, I, I think the people who keep yelling that you should be hodling are right. It, it, it's so far been proved right. And even though we are in the middle of a pandemic with weird economics, and even though now crypto is getting correlated to the main market, which mm -hmm. I think is disappointing a lot of people, like they were hoping it would serve as a, as a hedge. It's not a hedge, but Hey, that's actually, to me, it's a sign of confidence that it's like getting coupled to the real economy. You're shaking your I head. See. Like you don't agree. I have a lot of thoughts about <laughs> Bitcoin and how it relates to the rest of the financial world, but we don't have time to get into that right now, I don't think. think. Right, yeah, let's find a letter of the alphabet to slot that into, because that's an okay. interesting discussion I think worth having. Mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, get all the crypto people great. on our well, podcast. As always, it's a pleasure to have you on Scarpio season. Likewise. You're welcome um, back anytime, Lisa. Great, oh, thanks, Venkat. All right, great, I'll talk to you later. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.